So today um, we're going to talk about uh, uh, continuous updates and uh, what it is, uh, how it's different from any other kind of continuous things uh, and, and how we go about it and how we don't go about it. So uh, before we start talking about continuous updates, uh, I would like us to think about a couple of things that we take for granted. And, and first would be why at all we um, we, we, we update software. Obviously there is some software which doesn't require updating. And that's an example of a BC for probably most of you know, for those who don't, BC is, the co is a command line uh, calculator. Um, you type two plus two, I get four. And obviously this kind of software it's not updated very, very uh, frequently. You can see here the history of updates. Uh, frankly, I have no idea what those updates were required for. It's not that the basic rules of math changed from 1991 to 2000, but even considering those updates, you can see that it wasn't updated for 20 years, and it's probably okay. There is nothing, nothing to update there. Um, but obviously, the, this kind of software is is an exception. Most of the software is updated, updated frequently, and I would say that it updated frequently for too many reasons. Two too many reasons. The first is us. Uh, we are users, and what we want are shiny new features. Uh, obviously, we want shiny new features as frequently as possible, uh, and the best are now or, or, or even yesterday. And uh, you might relate to this um, if you had a phone back in the 90s, some uh, Nokia with um, or without the snake game. And, and thinking about it, if you didn't have the snake game, what did you do to get it? You actually, you had to buy a new phone. Um, you couldn't just install it. And uh, there was like this thing, data cable. I, I might, some of you might remember the data cables that you had to buy in the store. And what you could do with that? Nothing. You could probably back up your contacts to move them to a new phone when you buy a new phone to have a snake in. Uh, but obviously everything changed with, uh, um, with, with the iPhone 2007 and all the smartphone revolution. And now if you want a snake, you just go to Google Play Store or, or Apple Store or App Store and just download it. And, and you know what? Day after day you have new features, you have new levels, you have new, um, and new features of all your app that be installed. And this is something that we demand from, uh, from the market, we as, as users, and then we provide it to the users as developers. This is something that we are all uh, very used to those days, and probably th those companies who don't do that will become Nokia, for that example of our, uh, of our phones, if you wish. Um, the other reason, which is also very, very uh, important, um, is security. And um, as uh, every company becomes, becomes a software company, security vulnerabilities become the new oil spills. They become the most uh, threaded thing now. And, and you can uh, remember a couple of them that are uh, were really big deal. Probably as big deal as, as oil spills back in the day when uh, we had oil as the uh, king of the economy. The way to think about um, fighting security vulnerabilities is a little bit as the way to think about stopping distances back when you got your driving license, if you remember. So uh, there are two uh, different components to a stopping di uh, distance, um, uh, what they call a sinking distance and what you th they call a breaking distance, and they are completely different in, um, in what they are. So thinking difference is the neurons that, you know, fire in our brain as a reaction to light, uh, getting to our eyes retina, and then uh, the, the electricity that runs through our body to the muscles that, uh, uh, that actually push the brake pedal, and that's one kind of, of of this formula, and the other is completely different. Braking distance is about uh, you know the the, the the brakes that hit the wheel that that, that hit the uh, uh, the wheels and 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 their uh, and the chemistry between the rubber 
um, and 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 the the pavement and that's like completely different thing. Now, what's common between them is in order to shorter the stopping distance, you actually have to invest in shorting both of those with completely different tools. So with braking distance, you come with new alloys for the brakes, you come with better pavements, you come with uh, for, uh, better tires. Um, and for thinking distance, basically the only thing you can do is replacing drivers who are slow uh, humans with uh, machines, the autopilots, which react much faster. Uh, but anyway, two completely different aspects compose one one uh, one battle, and it's the same with security vulnerabilities. You can think about three different aspects of fighting those vulnerabilities. You have to identify that you are under attack, and then you have to fix the problem, patch it. Uh, most of the times, that will be just upgrading your dependencies. Dependencies might be um, an operating system patch um, that will close this vulnerability, an entire new operating system, um, and all the way to replacing a dependency in your code in order to patch the vulnerability. This is what we will do most of the time. And then the third aspect of it is the deployment, and this is where continuous pipelines, continuous updates become a big deal because this is where the fastest you will update your application, the better you will be. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I hope that's not the coronavirus. Um, it's good that it's a remote webinar, so even if it is, you're safe. And, um, well, the faster you will update your software, the better you are. And a couple of examples in this regard. So, um, you might remember um, almost three years ago now, uh, the, um, the vulnerability that took down the NSA hospitals uh, and uh, um, stuff like X-ray machines and MRI machines were completely shut down because uh, of the... Um, virus, PETA, not PETA, whatever ransomware hit them. So identify uh, those ransomware is designed to be identified immediately. Uh, but the fix, the fix is actually upgrading of the operating system. The problem was that those hospitals run Windows uh, XP, which was, was uh, out of, uh, um, after end of life by then, no, no security patches. This is why the vulnerability that this uh, ransomware used was and patched and obviously it took years for for those hospitals and the system to upgrade their operating system and this is why they got hit another example that you might remember is the equifax uh, debacle and what happened there is that um, attackers uh, used a struts 2 vulnerability uh, that was out there um, before they even identified for two months and the update was just you know changing the struts 2 version in their pom file and then it took them another two months to actually deploy to production to upgrade their production services and while we cannot know if shortening the vulnerability period from four months to two months was um, actually doing any favors, but we can expect that they have been in better shape if they uh, if the upgrade was faster. So basically, we are talking about. Um, more like an enterprise companies or government agencies that are very slow on upgrades and you can say well in our environment this is not the case we know how to upgrade um, uh, how to update our software immediately uh, so that won't happen and that's all good uh, news but it's not enough um, we started the last year a year ago with the announcement of um, spectre and meltdown attacks that you might remember and while People spoke mostly about Meltdown because uh, 10 lines of JavaScript code um, could expose passwords from uh, different parts of memory. Uh, I would claim that Spectre um, are much, is much more dangerous. The problem with Spectre is um, that um, as opposite to what this article say that they, uh, well, here, so what they say is most malware explodes coding errors and poor design. Now, Spectre, the problem with Spectre is that it's the other way around. It actually exploits good design. Uh, the, uh, the Spectre 
class attacks work by observing uh, how a well-designed uh, applications um, affect uh, the speculative execution uh, uh, in in memory and what de de uh, decisions the CPU makes based on uh, certain uh, conditions in the code and then they assume that a lot of other software is written in the same way will lead to the same speculative decisions. So the better code you write actually the more it is vulnerable for Spectre class attacks and that basically means that they are impossible to defeat. What are you going to do? You're going to write bad code just to confuse the speculative execution? Obviously not. So the problem is really that we start with zero-day vulnerability. We start with, okay, this code is vulnerable and now it's a race against uh, the attacker. And the race against the attacker is we need to identify the problem as fast as possible, we need to fix the problem as fast as possible, and then we need to update as fast as possible. And the updating as fast as possible, that's what this talk is about. Now, on the g bright side is that we are in a surprisingly good shape when it comes to continuous updates. Um, a state of DevOps report that many of you are familiar and whoever not definitely should go and read. That's the most important document um, in our industry and that's a report um, that is uh, built by what used to be called DevOps Research and Assessment Institute, which is now part of Google Cloud uh, with uh, Dr. Nicole Fosgreen and Jess Humble and Jin Kin and other wonderful people uh, who um, survey um, a lot of organizations, uh, more than 35 a thousand for last year and um, they build uh, they ask them questions and measure them on four different um, measurement scales and that's uh, the lead time how long it takes from a code to production the frequency of deployments how frequent the deployments are done in this organization and then um, the the rollbacks the, the failures of the deployment what percentage of those deployment fail and then time to recovery how long it takes to recover from a service uh, if a service goes down and uh, they take those questions and they group the uh, the organizations by cohorts and you can see that we have 20 percent of the industry um, are in the cohort of elite performance and that's every fifth organization do Doing a very good job and those are obviously great news and you can see that those elite organizations actually deploy multiple deploys a day that makes them obviously able to provide the value of those features to the users faster and also to be protected from vulnerabilities because they can or as much protected as they can be because they can update immediately after uh, the problem was identified and the fix was available. Um, and obviously they make them easier to recover from failures and, and all the rest, but for, for the sake of our uh, discussion those are the two main, uh, the two main uh, components. The fact that they can um, uh, they can be um, uh, rolling out features as fast as possible and that uh, they can up, uh, protect from security vulnerabilities. So 20% um, of the industry already does that and that's because it's not a new idea by, by any means. Uh, extreme programming 1998 actually uh, advocated for short feedback and that means releasing faster and then scrum reducing cycle time to absolute minimum releasing faster and then toyota production system decide as late as possible and deliver as fast as possible release faster and kanban incremental change smaller batches release faster all those are not new ideas and uh, this is why 20% of the industry already successfully do that. So, as uh, I was introduced by Jeffrey, my name is Baruch Sadogurski and I'm the Chief Sticker Officer in JFrog. If you need stickers, hit me on Twitter, I will hook you up. Um, at jbaruch, that's my Twitter handle and um, by now you should totally follow me, I promised you free stickers. Um, and uh, if you still not sure about the stickers, my Twitter handle is on the bottom of each and every slide. 
Um, this is the most important slide of this presentation. Uh, I prepared a special page for you, jeffrey.com the show notes. You go there and you find a page dedicated for this webinar. The slides are already there. The video we will upload later today. All the links to everything that I mentioned, including the um, State of the Ops report and everything else, is there as well uh, the place to comment to rate this talk and uh, a small token of appreciation for you joining this webinar a, a raffle uh, amazon echo dot go there and participate in this raffle um, raffle as well um, as i mentioned the bottom of every slide you have the link to show notes as well and my twitter handle the twitter handle of cloud native foundation that organizes this webinar and the liquid software hashtag that i will talk about a little bit later so with all this introduction aside let's cut to the chase so we want to update faster i hope i convinced you that updating faster is a good idea so let's see what can go wrong and the first example in question will be uh, java uh, mike reynold who is uh, mark reynold who is the platform i think head of platform for java the most important guy in the java world um, announced um, more than two years ago now that uh, java is moving uh, forward faster java will um, release updates faster um, that was as i mentioned three and a half years ago and that was when java 8 was in the release and they announced what we are going to release every six months instead of every year and a half two years three years four years um, it was really um, uh, not not that frequent every six months no matter what you have a new java version since then Java 9 was out, Java 10, Java 11, Java 12, and Java 13. Five Java versions was released since um, the announcement, and uh, let's see how that worked. So we we'll look at the state of the developer ecosystem report from JetBrains. That's the last one. By the way, they are now collecting answers for a new one, so go ahead and participate. But that's the last piece of data that we have. And by this report, we can see that 83% are still in Java 8. Just to remind you, Java 8 was out when the announcement actually came out. And you go like, doesn't make any sense. We just made a case for faster updates, and Java made uh, updates more available. Why people are not updating? To understand what happens, we need to understand how we actually update. For that, I prepared a small diagram for you. Uh, this is how we think about it. So, update is available, and then we need to decide, do we want it? If we decide that we don't want it, there is nothing interested, like Java 9, then we say, okay, no. I don't want to update. But if there are interesting things like every new Java version, then you go like, okay, are there high risks? If there are no high risks, you can just update. And you can think about tons of examples for that, starting from, you know, the, the, the non-mission critical apps on your phone. You have a new version of a game, would you update it? Yes. Or, you know what, Netflix, new version, would you update? Yes. Um, and there are no high risks because if something goes wrong, well, you're going to watch Hulu for a day. No big deal. Um, now, with your with Java version, that's your production systems, and there are obviously high risks. And the next question is, do you trust the update? And and for, to answer this question, um, I try to come up with a vendor that updates you blindly trust. And the closest that I can think about is Apple Circa. 2000 let's say 14 uh, if you've been on a mac back then and you saw a new update for mac os you probably and this is you definitely want it there are nice features it's super high risk that your working machine or your life in this laptop but you trust apple so you go ahead and you update no questions asked so this was nice um, since then ah, not so much and uh, if I will ask you how many of you uh, who are on Mac updated to the latest um, uh, Mac OS operating system, Catalina, that was out for like three months, I guess the percentage will be around 10%. And that's because you want the features, maybe they're sidecar, they're nice features, and they're very high risks, you don't trust the update. 
So the question is now, why don't we trust our vendors anymore? What happened to the trust that we used to put in them? One assumption will be, well, they forgot how to do a QA. Uh, Apple in 2014 knew how to do QA, by 2020 they forgot. Uh, well, I don't buy it. Uh, we only get better in the things that we do, uh, so that's kind of a very weird assumption to make. I would say that the other, uh, the other, con the, the other hypothesis is the complexity, and obviously the complexity is going up. And uh, we and Jeff Rog, as uh, the authors of some tools for managing binary files, measure everything in binary files in artifacts, and uh, we measure complexity in artifacts as well. So you can see how the numbers of artifacts that we need to, man to manage um, uh, grew over the years, starting from Agile back in 2000 when. Uh, we started to uh, do continuous integration, and that means building more and more, and then continuous delivery, that means that every artifact now might end up in production, so we need to keep them around and manage them. Infrastructure as code, or only, uh, suddenly or our servers and hardware or software as well, and then microservices raise the complexity tremendously. Obviously, Docker, every line we change in the docker file now produces a, a set of binaries that we need to manage and then serverless every 10 lines of javascript code is now an artifact that need to be me measured uh, that need to be managed and versioned and and uh, controlled and then obviously IOT now those 10 lights of JavaScript code live in every light bubble in my house so that makes it even more uh, hard to manage um, so complexity plays a very big role but I would claim that another uh, another problem is even more critical and that's a problem of having a lot of data so and this is um, kind of a prediction of global data sphere by 2025. Zettabytes is a lot. Uh, today we think about petabytes as a lot. And, and, you know, when we speak about big data, we refer to petabytes. There is one more after, and that's exabyte. And that's like really a lot. And after exabytes, this zettabytes. Now, this is something that we cannot even grasp as of today. And although, you know, this source of this research is Seagate, which might have interest in uh, inflating the numbers a little bit, but even if we divide it by 10 and we say it's 17 zettabytes, it's still, it's, it's, it's not comprehensible. And that means that officially staging is dead. And what I mean by that is that there is no sense, economic sense, in trying to replicate production environment that will look like, uh, uh, for staging, uh, uh, and build environment that look like production just because the amount of data is, 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 is so big that it doesn't make any economic sense. And, you know, the big companies already already testing in production. And one of the interesting examples that I experienced personally in testing in production, a couple of years ago, you can go on Facebook if you have an account and search for this hashtag, env uh, empty envelope from China, um, you can find a set of blog posts um, by my wife about a very strange thing that happened to her. Um, she uh, had an account in AliExpress, uh, to buy some um, stuff, and and um, suddenly out of the blue, she had she started to receive empty envelopes from China, from different providers. All look like this AliExpress thing, but she didn't order anything. There are no charges. Everything was um, was clean on her side. But envelopes kept coming. Sometimes empty. Sometimes they, it it had one white sock, or a red tape, or a piece of black cloth, or a handband or a plastic ring, completely random uh, stuff. And we were really puzzled on what's going on. We started to develop all kind of um, interesting conspiracy theories. And then um, my uh, um, good friend, Leonid Golnik, who is the senior uh, vice president of engineering now in SignalFX, um, came to visit and we told him this story and he's like, 
I don't even know why are you surprised. They obviously testing in production. They took a subset of the production database and ran their uh, provisioning uh, tests on it to see that you know that everything works and the, the, the goods uh, get out and this kind of stuff. And uh, well, that made sense. And and uh, this is one of the examples of how people don't use staging anymore because staging is 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 dead. So now we can know that data and complexity are a really big problems in guaranteeing quality and the question is okay so we don't trust those vendors what do we do about it the next question is can we verify the update sometimes we just say no it doesn't make sense new java version every six months it will take me eight months to um, do acceptance testing on all my production environments and check that everything is correct. It doesn't make sense to update now to the next Java version. By the time I will be done with my acceptance testing, new version will be out. So no, I just won't update. Or if I really, really want to, then I need to do all the acceptance tests. I need to do the time consuming verification, which makes the dilemma for us as software providers because now in order to convince our users who will do acceptance testing because they don't trust us because the complexity and the data we need to put a lot of food on the table we need to make sure that we have so appealing features that people will update regardless of the uh, of the acceptance costs right so the, we have a trade-off now features that we really want acceptance uh, test costs and we as users need to decide whether we should update because the features are so great we uh, we are willing to um, th live through the acceptance test costs or we want to update to this version at all because the features are not so great and the acceptance costs are very very painful can we go around this trade-off in some way? Can we cheat in some way? Well, we can. Um, in this case, it will look like update available. Do we want it? Yes. Or yes, because now what will ask us? Auto update is turned on and now we will get the update regardless of what, what's going on. And this will only work for stuff that is not high risk. And examples of that is your browser. I bet the majority of you have no idea what version of browser are they running. Um, or, or Twitter in your browser, that's, that's a website. You, there are some versions behind the scenes, but you have no even way to know which version is that. Twitter on your smartphone, there is a version, there is an update, but for the majority of us now, auto-updating turned off, it updates automatically, you have no idea what version it is. And what all those have in common is the low risk. Now, for example, the operating system of your smartphone, here you probably know the version because updating the operating system is something that requires human intervention because the risks are high. And this is where you go into this dilemma, back to this dilemma, are there enough features and do I want to take the risk of updating for those features? So, now let's talk about building this trust because this is what it's all about if we can build the trust to the level that the consumers trust that again then there is no problem with making them updating faster enjoying these features and being protected against vulnerabilities so what can possibly go wrong and in the spirit of the personal stories that i started with here is another one um, some years ago, I bought Google Wi-Fi, um, which was called OnHub back then, and that was a router from Google, amazing piece of technology, still loving it. Uh, one of the features that was really appealing is the self-improving system. Self-improving system, is known today, is the over-the-air updates. Um, it's sitting there, getting updates once in a while, and actually getting better and better with time. And, and one day, um, Three years ago, I was on a, um, on a trip and, and uh, my wife is calling me and um, she's like, I came back from work and our kids are sitting in the dark. And I'm like, is it a power outage? And she's like, no, the electricity, the electricity is, is, uh, is fine, it's the internet is down. 
and the kids are shouting, Alexa, turn the lights on, Alexa, turn the lights on, nothing happens, so they just sit in the dark. So that day they learned that there are physical switches on the wall, but the internet was still down, so I called our provider, our provider like everything is good, but then I get this email. And this email goes like, oops, sorry, we send an over the air update to your router and it reset it to the original settings. Uh, so now we cannot fix it with additional over the air update because your system is disconnected from the, from the internet so we cannot reach it and now you need to go ahead and reconfigure it from scratch. Now the problem is to get an email you need you need Wi-Fi, you need internet. I was on a trip, so I was on a conference Wi-Fi or, or hotel, so I got this email, we configured it, and everything worked fine. But yeah, there is this problem that update can go catastrophically wrong and over their patch cannot reach the device. And in our example, it was mild, you know, that was just a reconfiguration of a router at home. But think about controllers, edge systems on a solar array somewhere in Sahara Desert. It will take like three days to even get there in order to reconfigure it and three days are, you know, it's, it's a lot of production lost. Um, the solution to it is um, having previous version saved on the device to, to, to update and rolling back if the problem occurs. The, the beautiful thing about this is that it's not a new idea. And this is a, a screenshot from, I don't know, Windows 98 that did exactly that. Uh, you remember when you had the, your desktop computer connected to a display and you changed the resolution? Uh, there was this warning on the screen when you come back, should we revert the settings? And this is be because if the resolution wasn't picked uh, didn't match to the display, the display go dark, and then you have no way to roll it back. So instead, there is an automatic rollback built-in in case something went wrong. And this is exactly how it works with local rollbacks today. Well, they are a little bit more complicated, but that's exactly the same idea. And unfortunately, Google Wi-Fi back then didn't have this feature. Well, I mentioned again, low uh, low risks because that's a router at home, but I would expect other devices to have it if they are harder to physically reach and, and, and fix. Now, this is obviously an IoT example. Both the router and the Edge device that I mentioned are from the IoT domain, but I would argue that the T in IoT stands for things, and things is everything, including the, the servers that we update in our data center, the servers that we update in the cloud, and basically everything else. Uh, and if we are talking about fun stuff to update um, in IoT domain, let's talk about uh, updating cars. Again, what can possibly go wrong when you update cars? Um, here's a wonderful example. Jaguar I-Pace released last year um, a very uh, luxurious, obviously, electric car uh, that had a, a softer bug in their brakes. Well, when that happens, what do you do? Um, if you don't have software updates, then you just have to do a recall. This is what Jaguar did. And the problem with the recall is that they are very costly. You have to have a network of services that will do the recall and will implement the fixes, and you pay a lot of money for those recalls. And the other problem, and one can argue it's an even bigger one, you can or not actually force um, an, an, an up update. Um, what are you going to do? You're going to send them an, an, a mail, like a letter, and maybe in a red envelope to get their attention. But in the end of the day, if they are not willing to do the update, to, to answer the recall, they just won't do it. And obviously when you have a problem with breaks, that's kind of a big deal. And obviously the way to, to, to solve it is um, using over-the-air uh, software updates, um, preferably continuous updates. And the difference between the normal over-the-air updates and continuous updates is this, for example. 
So that's another self-driving car. That's another uh, software software driven car and that's Tesla and um, one of the problems with, with Tesla autopilot namely is what it's called uh, phantom braking. Phantom braking is you drive the car and the conditions are perfect there is no interference out of the out of the blue the car slams and brakes and uh, there was a rumor that the, there is a fix coming out and people are waiting for this fix weeks after weeks. And the reason they didn't get this fix is because chess. Uh, you can see here an update which include this bug fixes, small minor bug fixes note on the release notes and that is the fix for the phantom braking. But the people didn't get it because they waited for this big feature which is a chess game to come out and there is chess game in the Tesla that you play while your car is charging it's fine it's important is it as important as fixing the phantom braking well depends to whom if you use the autopilot features obviously it is more important for you but if you are a chess enthusiast and you re and you don't use autopilot is the other way around chess is the most most impo more important features so regardless of what weighted to what when you do batch updates important features whatever is important for the user and that might differ between the users wait for non-important features right so for me i had to wait for chess to get the the the, the fix for the break someone else had to maybe wait for uh, this um, irrelevant fix for their autopilot while they're waiting for the chess features. So instead, you implement continuous updates, you implement over-the-air updates, and then you deliver the features as they come out. And now I want to make like a very short quiz um, poll to make sure that you are not asleep at least. And I want to ask you how many of you are um, IoT or, or, mobile, uh, or mobile developers. So let's see if we can. Here we go. Um, are you an IoT mobile developer? Let's see the results real quick. Um, I don't think I have an access to the results. So uh, yeah, Taylor, can you tell us what the result look like? Okay, so you see the, the minority of you, seven people uh, are, are the IoT or mobile developer, the, the rest of you are not, and that's obviously a cloud native uh, webinar which is about cloud and server side. And you might think why are even I waste your time talking about that, but the thing is our life as server side developers, as cloud native developers, is easy comparing to the mobile and the IoT world because the, for, for IoT, mobile and automotive, they don't control the availability of the target they're updating. They don't know if the, the, the computers are on or off. They don't control the state of the target. They don't know if there are in-flight requests, if there is something happening on the device. They don't know which version are they going to update. Maybe this device didn't get updates for the last three years and the other device is, is in, in the latest version. And they don't have access to the target in case uh, something went wrong and they need to log into it. We can always go and log into our servers and see what's going on. They don't have this luxury. So our life as server-side developers is much easier and still we manage to, um, to, to royally screw it up. And the, the biggest example, it's a little bit old, it's like eight years ago, but it's uh, so powerful that uh, I feel that I want to share with you, is the Knight Capital uh, disaster. Um, so Knight Capital is a trading f was a trading firm uh, doing um, automatic trading on, um, on New York Stock Exchange, and they decided to roll out a new system. For some reason, they decided to reuse some old APIs. And the, uh, now the, the same APIs did something completely different, uh, selling instead of buying, think about that way. And uh, for some reason during the update, one of the eight servers was not updated. And uh, new clients now uh, send requests to uh, seven new updated machines that did what needs to be done but one machine contained the old code so it did something completely different and the engineers saw that it misbehaved it 
did something different. And what they do is, okay, we need to stop the upgrade. So they shut down the updated machine and now 100% of the traffic goes to the machine that did something completely wrong. And there is no monitoring, no alerting, no debugging. And basically think about it, they are sitting and trying to debug what's going on in real time and uh, they are actually losing millions of dollars every second they did it. The fix took 42 minutes, they lost more than $400 million during those 42 minutes and basically went out of business. And that's a horrifying story. Um, I have a link uh, to more detailed explanation of what happened in the show notes. Just to remind you, jeffrey.com says show notes. And there is like, it's a, it's a marvelous story and a really, really scary one. Um, what could help? Um, first of all, people are just bad in repetitive tasks. So instead of manually updating servers, we are um, we we automate everything, and um, this is how uh, we make sure that eight servers out of eight are updated. And then uh, another problem is that they did this deployment after many years of not doing any deployment to uh, to production, and obviously they had no skill, they have um, no habit of doing that. And that was a very stressful event, things went wrong. Instead, if you uh, update frequently, you develop skill and habit and it's not a big deal. So the chances of you screwing up uh, are lowered. Um, and another problem is um, they reuse some state on the target machine. That might be a good decision, might be a bad decision, but regardless of that, you really need to know and consider the target state when updating and reverting might require, uh, sorry, and reverting might require revert of the state and knowing what will happen during reverting of the updates. So another marvelous example, and this is pretty fresh, that's July last year, is Cloudflare. Cloudflare went down, took uh, most of the internet with it. What happened? Um, so Cloudflare battles uh, DDoS attacks and, and other type of attacks on the internet with uh, routing rules that they um, deploy frequently uh, and uh, they deploy it all the time. And uh, one time in deployment of a single misconfigured rule. Now, what happened next uh, for me convinced me that we are this universe, this world won't gonna die of coronavirus, won't gonna die on um, uh, nuclear war, and not even global warming. What will take this world down is um, um, a regular expression, because as you can see in this example, a single misconfigured regular expression spiked CPU of a server to 100% and obviously um, shut it down and they propagate the next thing you know affected region earth. That's a quote from their uh, from the status page. Some humor um, definitely a needed situation. So yeah affected region earth everything is down because of single misconfigured regular expression. And this is weird because you expect from a very progressive company like Cloudflare to actually implement a progressive delivery because what they did is they released a bug that affected all users. Instead, you should release to a small number of users first, effectively reducing the blast of radius and then observe. And if a problem occurs, you stop the release, you revert um, or updated the affected users. And uh, the most important, the most interesting part of it is that progressive delivery, it's something that the majority of us probably learned when we were like eight years old, when our parents teach us how to do laundry. Because every data again, I have this warning always spot test on a hidden service first. And this is progressive delivery. You try somewhere when, uh, to minimize the blast, to minimize the damage, and then you observe and check if it works or not. And if it doesn't work, you don't do it, or you revert it, or you do something else. So this comes obviously with observability. Some feedbacks are hard to trace relying on user feedback only. People yelling on Twitter is a good feedback, probably not good enough to uh, troubleshoot the problem to the root. Instead, tracing, monitoring, and logging help with that as well. 
um, rollback. So now you you tried it and you see there is a problem. Next thing you do, you roll it back. So fix my uh, take time, users suffer in the meanwhile, instead you implement rollback, the ability to deploy the previous version without delay. Now it sounds reasonable and simple, uh, not every platform supports it. So for example, when you are on mobile, not uh, Google Play and not uh, App Store allow to do rollback. If you have a problem and you want to roll back to a previous version of the same app, you actually take the previous version, rename it as a next version, and then submit it to review. And the review will take whatever it will take, three days, five days. You can flag it in urgent. If you're still not in luck and it's Friday, you won't get it until Monday. I mean, there is no way to roll back a version on the mo in the mobile world today, which is a very sad state of affairs. Um, so instead, you can use feature flags to implement kind of rollback. You embed two versions of the app and you control them with API um, calls and then you can turn off the uh, misbehaving part of the app for those who are suffering. And I think the last one as the most dramatic example is MoviePass who sh uh, they shut down their their app, their mobile app for several weeks to update. And that's just ridiculous because we're talking about zero downtime updates and someone go ahead and promise to come back with an app in five weeks. Probably by the time they come back, they won't have any, any, any users. That's exactly what happened to MoviePass. They went out of business after updating their app for five weeks. And, and then the, uh, obviously the, the opposite of it, the zero downtime over the air updates of small and frequent continuous updates is um, is the way to go. So just to summarize, continuous updates are frequent, are automatic, are well tested, progressively delivered, state aware, um, observable, and implement local local uh, rollbacks. Those are all. Um, obvious stuff. Local rollbacks can be challenging, that's kind of an extra credit task, but still necessary sometimes to implement. And, and now what we have is we have an update. Do we want it? Doesn't matter. Automatic continuous update. And then there are sometimes no high risks or even there are high risks. We are now trust the update and then we update um, uh, without fear. This is what we want to end up with and for that is our goal to transition from bulk and rare software updates to extremely tiny and extremely frequent software updates, so tiny and so frequent that they provide an illusion of software flowing from development to an update target. And we call it the liquid software vision. This is why you have the liquid software hashtag on the bottom of every slide. and. To, this vision is encapsulated in a book, it's called Liquid Software, and have uh, the concept of uh, uh, continuous updates. Um, two co-founders of JFrog, Fred Simon and Joab Lyman, and um, uh, yours truly um, uh, co-authored this book. And the good news are is that um, if you ping me on Twitter, in DMs, or even publicly, I will be more than happy to send you uh, this book, to ship you a physical hard uh, um, a hard copy of this book, ping me on Twitter, at jbaruch, and you will get this book um, uh, after, after this webinar. But uh, before we wrap up, I want to talk about corner cases. Um, we believe that the majority of the, um, of the software should be delivered in a liquid software way uh, with continuous updates. Are there any corner cases? And to give you an example uh, of such a corner case, I would like to ask you another question, and, and that, do you think that updating an aircraft mid-flight is, um, is a good idea? So you will have the poll up in a sec, and you will be able to express your opinion on that. Uh, oh, here we go. Do you think upgrading an aircraft mid-flight is a good idea? Let's see what we have. And again, Taylor, can you share with us what people say?
Okay, 16% say yes, that's a lot. But let's, let's see if we can drive it even harder. So, uh, here is Airbus A350. Airbus A350 has a memory leak. And it needs to be rebooted every 149 hours. If you don't reboot it, memory leak, software crashes. Software that actually flies the plane. So here is a hypothetical situation. You are now on a flight from San Francisco to Tokyo over the Pacific you already past Hawaii. You have like three hours, I don't know, five hours more to fly. And, and, and then the co-pilot asked the pilot, hey, by the way, did we reboot this morning? Because I think we kind of run out of this 149 hours. And they're like, oh no, I think we forgot. Do you think that patching this, uh, patching, patching this memory leak mid-flight, sending continuous update that actually fixes it would be a nice idea? You might start thinking differently than you voted, and to prove that I'm not the, one, the only one and you are not the only one who thinks it might be a nice idea, here is a proof. And this is from the great book from project to product, you know where to find the link, uh, jeffrey.com says show notes, uh, Boeing 777 uh, um, had a problem during the design uh, with uh, st stabilizing the shaking during turbulence and they couldn't debug it um, or, um, on, the, on the ground so they took all the software engineers, put them on the flight, took off, went to the turbulence zone debugged it in flight and found the problem and actually updated mid-flight to make sure that the fix helps. So this is something that has been done. This is something that is definitely might be a very good idea. The secret is to trust the upgrade. And to trust the update, there are very good advice in this webinar and also in the book. So with that, just to summarize, my name is Baruch, at jbaruch on Twitter. Liquid Software is the hashtag that uh, you use on Twitter when you talk about that. At Cloud Native Foundation is the Twitter handle of the Cloud Native Foundation that hosts this webinar. And liquidsoftware.com is the website of the book when you can learn more. And jeffgrid.com says show notes is where you go for the slides, the video, all the links, um, comments and ratings and your chance to win Amazon Echo Dot if you fill out a little form. With that, thank you very much.